let's start with that idea then. We have the provincial budget that's expected, and it's not a normal budget year. We do indeed, it's, it's actually quite historical in Manitoba. We're coming out of an unprecedented leadership race, and we're in an election year. So a budget in an election year is not like a budget in the first year of your mandate. It is completely different. And so how does that then uh, change the emphasis for provincial governments? And uh, for you as an economist, if you were giving advice right now to, if you had the ear of Premier Salinger, what would you be saying in an election year for what the budget should be doing in, uh, for Manitoba. So we'll start with uh, we'll start with you, Chris, and then we'll go to uh, Lauren and then and then to Wayne. Sure. I mean, well, what we're looking for is essentially the budget is going to be their platform. Um, it's their their last real chance to write down everything that they're going to be running on, and uh, you can expect that a lot of these same storylines and themes are going to be carried on throughout the year um, and then put together in a, a sort of blueprint for the government as they head forward. So um, as I say, kind of putting it into a context and a storyline, Shannon points out a really good point. This is an election budget and that's, I think, the, the biggest thing that we need to dial in on as, as reporters and as journalists, seeing how they're going to position themselves heading into, uh, heading into the election. Do they swing to the left? Do they have kind of uh, center-right policies? What are we seeing in there? What kind of a campaign are they going to be running on? Is it going to be kind of like a steady as she goes, we have everything under control, reference the conference board 19 times um, for the great work that the, uh, that it's, that's being done there? Or are we going to see a lot of new initiatives? Um, we don't expect them to be balancing the books until 2016, 2017. So we're going to want to see if there's a new commitment or a different revised commitment on that. But it's uh, going to be some of those things, that the specific commitments that we'll see in the budget will give us this, an idea of how they're going to try to run their election campaign, I would, I would say. Well, I talked a little bit about what we were hoping to see and what we think we'll see in terms of just kind of <clears throat> generally. But in terms of it being an election budget, they are a little constrained in that regardless of your political stripe or the political stripe of the, the government, uh, election year budgets are supposed to be kind of this goody budget, right, where you start spending and, and showing, you know, spreading the, the wealth and uh, you know, giving everyone candy. So, but they do find themselves in that situation of not being able to do that because of the systemic deficit that's being created. So they're a little hamstrung in that regard. Ideally, they would love this to be a spending budget where they can, you know, invest in those key areas to, to show, uh, to, well, to invest. Um, I do expect that you will see, uh, again, that niche investment, those niche program adjustments in very key strategic uh, population groups that they're targeting to shore up support for the election. So, and you've already started to see it again. They, they talked about the, uh, the education tax rebate for, for senior citizens. Uh, again, recognizing that they can't follow through on that commitment, so they're going to adjust. But again, you're starting to see those kind of program adjustments to really shore up key support amongst their base. And, and really, I think they're in a position where that's all they can do because they open themselves up to, if they do open the bank, uh, or the credit card in this case, because there's nothing left in the vault, uh, if they do that, then they run the risk of just completely leaving themselves vulnerable to opposition party attacks of uh, reckless spending gone wild. So really, it's a difficult budget for them to do too much. Um, well, the province is uh, in a different situation from the federal government, which has uh, has some money to spend, or at least thought it did, until they found out how badly our revenues are going to come in. But um, uh, you know, the provincial government has uh, these problems, and one of them is balanced budget legislation, which it hasn't said it won't. Uh, re-up on, and it's going to, uh, it's suspended the legislation, but it says that it's going to balance the budget in 1617, and then it's going to, I guess, restore the legislation. I'm not sure that's a terribly good idea, because I don't think uh, not only the province of Manitoba, but other provinces are taking the kinds of actions that make that really a meaningful commitment. And you've got to have a pretty uh, ambitious savings plan to have the kinds of resources needed to uh, deal with the, even a, a modest uh, 
downturn in the business cycle like we had the last time. So if you don't do that, uh, you're really just uh, uh, promising something that you can't deliver and then the next time a, a downturn comes, the, uh, the province, I guess, would suspend the legislation again. So that doesn't seem to be a, a very meaningful legislation as it stands. Um, so the provincial government has a, a difficult road. I, I guess uh, from the other side, uh, for those who want to take uh, the 1% uh, PST back, which would be the opposition, uh, they're going to take 2% out of revenues, which is going to make things even more difficult. So they may try to, uh, uh, I, I imagine they'll hold the line on that, uh, given the, uh, that the premier is still a premier. So I, I don't expect any changes there. Okay, I'm going to get back to you on the issue of transfer payments in the federal government because the provincial budget is also reliant on the federal budget and also they're going into an election year. I'm not quite ready to go there yet, but keep that in the back pocket as we as we continue. Now, the, the other thing is the first group that will be watching this with all manner of peeled eyes is, of course, the opposition. And the opposition will have their own perspective and their own spin to put on this. Nothing that we do, nothing, uh, pardon me, nothing that the NDP do uh, is actually going to be satisfying for uh, Mr. Pallister. And the fact that there's been yet another deficit uh, is, is going to be easy for him to take advantage of. So again, if you could whisper, and I'll start with you, Wayne, if you could whisper in the eye of the opposition leader, how, what would you tell him for advice on this provincial budget? Um, I would uh, say nothing about equalization payments, which are going to make life more difficult for any, any government in 1617. Uh, I would, um, he, I'm not sure what he's going to say about, uh, in specifics, I think he's going to rely on the notion that uh, a conservative government might have a better reputation as fiscal managers, and basically say that they'll find ways to uh, reduce expenditures uh, and grow revenues. Um, I think to close the gap will be difficult, but uh, I, I think uh, specifics are their enemy, so I don't expect them. Well, the province has been around for a few years, and <laughs> when, when our advice to government is always take the long view. We're not looking for government to take reckless cuts. That is not in the best interest of anyone. Uh, what we're looking for is a plan. That simple. And, it, and you might think, well, there is a plan. There isn't a plan. I can assure you there's no plan. Nothing written, nothing thought about. There's no plan. Um, what we need is that vision as, okay, we're going to get here. This is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to benchmark it. And this is how we're going to make progress. Because that's how business thinks. This is, we're going to make this investment to this goal. And this is how we're going to get there. So, and as, as long as, and I'm just speaking from a business perspective here, obviously, um, business has always said, if we had that, if we could see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, and confidence that government was going to stick to it, and not run at the first sign of, there's rain in a floodplain, we're in trouble. Like, we've had flooding here for, I don't know, thousands of years. This shouldn't come as a shock, yet it seems to be. And I'm sorry if that seems kind of argumentative or just uh, playful, but that's the kind of thing I'm thinking. Let's let's have a plan, and that would be my advice to the uh, if it were Pallister, would be set that out. Give us the confidence that you you know where you want to go and how you're going to get us there. And you know what? By and large, be it people or business, they will give you the benefit of the doubt. They will say, "Okay, we believe you. Let's go." And as, as you make progress on that plan, people's confidence and trust in your ability to actually get there grows. But the minute you start deviating, the minute you start using more excuses than, uh, than uh, ideas, that's when people start to write you off. I'll just go out on my own. Um, yeah. Excuses without ideas and then also problems without solutions. So I think that's the big thing that the opposition needs to really focus on, is if they're raising problems, come up with ideas or solutions of ways that they would do it better. I think that that's obviously the key for a good opposition, what they need to do. Um, one specific would be the PST increase. The opposition has consistently said that they would, in their first mandate, within their first mandate, uh, repeal the PST increase. But as we know, a mandate is four years, and that would be four years after they were to get elected, which would be just two years 
shy of what the NDP is promising with their 10-year plan. So that promise, well, sounds great on paper, we will repeal it within our first um, mandate, it really isn't very different than what the government is pursuing, and at the end of the day, it's something like $280 million. So that's nothing. When we're talking about how much the government is, is, uh, is, is making and, and spending, um, it's a very small drop in the bucket. So uh, it's interesting to see their specific policy platforms, the opposition, and how they consistently say that they are business friendly. Um, how? What are you going to do different as far as uh, business is concerned? Each time I ask them that, the answer is, well, we're going to first take a look at the books and we are going to repeal the PST increase within our first mandate. But I'll ask them specific questions about raising the small business threshold from 400 to 500,000 or repealing the payroll tax. Um, there, there aren't specific promises on those sorts of things, but as far as the PST, that seems to be their main laser focus at this point, as far as I can see. And just to talk about the third opposition party, or the second opposition party, I guess, the Liberals, um, they've already come out with policies on both of those two things that I just mentioned, um, trying to attract a more business-friendly uh, base, I guess. So I guess that would be my advice, if I was so bold as to offer it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So let's get back to this Conference Board of Canada report because it's been touted as the sort of like the, the NDP are using this as sort of a plank. Look at how great the economy is doing. The Conference Board of Canada has rates us number one. Well, in reality, the Conference Board of Canada says, yes, you're number one, but that's because the other provinces are doing really crappy. And that is the caveat that goes along with that. And so when we're in federation, which we are, Canada's federal and a federal state uh, country, uh, when other provinces are doing poorly, we can expect that the government, this uh, federal government, is not going to be as forthcoming with equalization payments, the transfer payments. And so, can you talk about a little bit about that and the implications of that for, for Manitoba going forward, particularly in, again, the context of an election year, both levels? Well, the um, equalization payments are a three-year moving average leg two years. So what that means is that equalization payments we're receiving now, which are a little lower than they have been, they've been declining just gently, are based on what happened um, three, four, and five years ago. So what this means is that we're protected for a couple of more years from what's happening now, but uh, we're not protected in the long term. And I said, as I said, in, in 2016-17, which is really the first budget after this election, then uh, it looks from all signs that there will be a fairly significant drop in equalization payments because the have provinces are largely the provinces with um, oil revenues, uh, I think solely the provinces with oil revenues, and they're all suffering. Saskatchewan less than the other two because they also have potash, but all three provinces are suffering. And uh, the formula is going to uh, hit us pretty hard. Um, and. You know, equalization is half of federal transfers and a seventh of our, our total uh, revenues. So it's not hard to figure that that's going to bite pretty sharply in 2016-2017. Apocalyptic almost. Did you want to add more? Yeah, I did. And, you know, I love the equalization discussion because it really underscores what is a major concern for me, both as a, a Manitoban, but given where I work, and that we're a have-not province. Um, that bugs me. Because, not so much that we are, but we accept that that's all we can be. And I know, because whenever I have this argument with people, they're always like, ah, you know, we're only one million people. Only one million people. Israel, seven million people. A number of years ago said, and they didn't have much of an economy, desert economy. Uh, in many ways, um, you gotta be careful how I put this, but some of the challenges they have were some of the challenges Manitoba had. But they decided they were gonna revolutionize how they did access to capital for business. They are now the global leader in access to capital, venture capital, startups, technology, all that. Because they put a plan into place, they weren't scared of failure. Failure in, in that kind of market is actually embraced. And they went from nothing absolutely nothing in terms of access to capital where New York is investing in Israel. So can it be done? Yeah. What do we get? Excuses. 
And again, it's just a mindset. Um, we just have to stop making excuses as why we can't do things. I, we've all seen, I remember when we did the bold platform we released, sorry, I'm mixing governments here, I know, but, um, and I was asked the question, well, some of the ideas you have are pretty crazy. You know, can you really do that? And I said, at one point, they didn't think the jets would ever come back, and I know you've heard that before. But again, some of the things we celebrate in this city, at one time, someone said, really? How, how realistic is that? So we're our own worst enemies when it comes to stuff like this. So when I hear the whole equalization issue, I say, let's stop making it something we have to worry about by setting our own fate, by being masters of our own home, and being the ones that are complaining about how much we're contributing to the equalization program. Wouldn't that be novel just once? Yeah, and just to pick up off the uh, excuses comment, because when we look at equalization money, we have to look at all the federal transfers that we get. And while equalization is down slightly, I believe health and uh, social money that we get through the federal government has actually increased by like 6% or something this past year. So we have to look at it as the big picture of what we're getting, what we're, what we're not getting. And we can't just look at that one number of equalization and let that be the full the full story. So you have to look at that kind of full picture, I would say. And then, I, are you going to be talking about Statistics Canada? Uh, if you want me to. Well, because, I mean, this is something that is... St there are Statistics Canada uh, apparently counted Manitoba down by 18,000 people, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Oh yeah, so the problem with the Statistics Canada numbers and the fact that that means that we do not get as much money. Jennifer Howard was complaining about that now for two years. Yeah, She's absolutely. lost that fight over and over again. So, and the only reason why I bring it up is because it, it follows on the conversation about excuses. Because this is something, 18,000 people is what we were alleged to have been misrepresented because of the 2011 flood and displacement. Uh, oh, sorry. I always think I'm loud, so I'm not sure if anybody can ever not hear me. Um, but yeah, so it's $100,000 each year, or $100 million each year, I should say, and uh, the impact that that is having on the provincial government, they say, is huge, and they're blaming the federal government for this. Statistics Canada has said each time that we call them on this matter that they revisited the numbers that they did, that the, they re-looked at the statistics models that they did. They're the same for every province and they didn't find any errors, so it's not going to be something that they're going to address or deal with. So to kind of get back to what Lauren was saying was, this issue has kind of been dealt with on a number of different occasions, so perhaps it's time to move, move on. on. Yes, exactly. You know, uh, just two quick points. I want to make it very clear. <clears throat> the Chamber, we're very political, but we're nonpartisan. And I know a lot of people kind of go, you know, right. Um, the fact is, we've had wonderful, some of the best working relationships we've had have been, for example, when it was Premier Dewar, um, wonderful working relationship with Premier Dewar. Did we agree on everything? Absolutely not. Did we agree with everything when it was Premier Filmin? Absolutely not. But again, it spoke to that, at least we felt like we were being heard and our concerns had a place at the table. Civically, Glenn Murray, I worked with him, fantastic person to work with. Did we agree with everything he stood for? Absolutely not. But again, it's that relationship, it's that feeling of you being listened to. On the Statistics Canada issue, to me that one is kind of reflective of sometimes what budgets like to do, and that's kind of the bread and circuses thing. Uh, remember the, the, I can't remember how many years ago it was the federal budget when they announced that they were phasing out the one cent. That's all anyone could talk about. We're getting rid of the penny. Wow, look at the cost savings. Oh, I don't have to worry about the pennies anymore. Boy, they're really annoying. Who cares? Like, really, it's a federal budget worth billions of dollars. And, and it know, saved $10 million. And it Again, saved $10 million. let's talk about how small that is. But what were people talking about? The pennies go. And it was just, again, another measure. See, just so you see, I'm picking on everyone equally. Um, it really was a measure designed to distract from the real issues that are incorporated into the budget. Plain and simple. Why would you announce that? In, in, a, in a budget, like save $10 million and get rid of the penny. Are you really that emotionally vested in the penny that you needed to know this in a budget? Like, do you feel your life is that much richer because you now know that? I'm gonna hazard a guess, no. But Statistics Canada is the same kind of issue. Well, in there kind of lies the biggest problem with journalists covering budgets is we see one shiny penny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here on that. 
and we jump on it, and we talk about that and that alone, and then you have the you go to the penny, you go to the mint, and you have stories out of that, and it's, right. it, it takes over the news agenda. It's, it's also because it's easy to explain, and we can do it in eight seconds. Let's give us credit. We are that that kind of peripheral. <laughs> you wanted to see something. And as we well. have a video. You control the mint. You control the penny. But I was just going to say that I think the uh, government would be happy if they had the shiny penny diversion in this budget because I think this is going to be a difficult budget to defend and they're already in a difficult situation. Um, uh, in the, in the Winnipeg Free Press newsroom, their editorial team, there's three of us. There's myself, there's Catherine Mitchell, and there's Dave O'Brien. Dave O'Brien is one of those lovely, kind of nice, easygoing guys. And then he's with Catherine Mitchell and I two type A personality females at the same age that'll tell you what's going on half the time. And the other day the announcement came in that we were having this seniors tax credit and Catherine and I went apoplectic. It's like really the senior citizens with no kind of wage, uh, like no kind of income thing, they're going to give them uh, the ability to say no to uh, paying school taxes. I've never had a baby. Why do I have to pay school? I mean, it, th this is one of those things, but it's that kind of boutique-ness. And the problem that I have is that I think that boutique is the hitting the, missing the mark. But w w what does it say when the government is going after that boutique and ignoring perhaps other boutiques like the business sector? And what would you give for advice in the budget to sort of ameliorate that? Uh, I think they're reflecting the fact that uh, older people vote in much higher proportions, and there's a lot more of them. Uh, and I think that's the simple calculation. Plus, it was a promise that they made, and they, they, they're going to break a lot of other promises, so they probably don't want to break that one. The babies, we just have to have more of us and, no, and vote more frequently. Yeah. Another thing, uh, I remember when the Museum for Human Rights opened, and we were saying, it's only government takes your money, spends it on something, throws, the, throws a, a wild opening, stands up, expects you to applaud it. And, and that's, that's not anti-government, it's just a comment, like, as it relates to the boutique, don't use, don't use our money to buy us. Like, don't, I would rather no boutique programs, no niche tax cuts. Uh, actually, the tax cut, the niche tax cuts drive us nuts, because that's patchwork policy. That's what you do when your tax system's broken and it's leaking holes everywhere. So you start trying to do these fixes. These, and you know what? That, there's a huge cost to that in terms of administration. Uh, the cost of regulation in this country, does anyone know what the estimate of the cost of regulation in Canada is for business? $35 billion. $35 billion. Um, might be not enough, but that's a lot. And so when you do these niche changes, all it does is add complexity to the system, frustration, and the only ones that win are the accountants and the lawyers, right? Because they're the ones interpreting it. And there's a whole bureaucracy created to sustain this. That's what niche gets you. Because now, okay, you can do a simple thing like, I'm gonna give a, a tax credit for senior citizens. And don't get me wrong, I want to state this unequivocally, the senior citizens have built this country, I take nothing away from them. Uh, they've worked hard, and it's not for me to sit there and say they shouldn't or shouldn't get it. It is more a question of, great, you've done this, now there's an entire bureaucracy that has to be created to manage it, because you just it's not a simple matter of just flicking a switch, there's work that needs to be done to administer that. So I'd rather them just create a, a good system, and as opposed to the niche to try to fix the bad one. Uh, the, the best fight against niche tax credits I think we're seeing right now on the federal stage with the income splitting. Um, it sounded like an awesome promise, I think, for a lot of people when it was pitched during the last campaign. Um, but I think, in this case, the media and other special, special interest groups are doing a really good job of fact-checking it and finding out that it will only affect whatever the number was, 15 percent. and. Um, it won't impact that many people, and it will impact these people in the upper and um, middle tax brackets. Uh, so I think that it's important when we do see these niche credits, um, they're going to happen in every budget, but it's important for us to actually fact check them and to find out if they will even help the niche that they're alleged to be helping. Right, and, and absolutely, and, and, uh, and also how expensive it's going to cost us.